In this video, let's talk about this blog post by Recall, which says how they reduce their WebSocket cost over a million dollars per year on their AWS bill. And a million dollars is not a small amount, so I'm sure there are a lot of learnings we can have in this blog post and see how they reduced the bill so much. Especially WebSockets, because it's always tricky one way or another with WebSockets in general. So if you look at Recall's homepage, you would be able to figure out that this is an application which allows you to sort of record your meetings. So you can have a Google or a zoom link just given to recall bot and what it will do is it will probably create summaries it will have transcripts it will give you the video file it will give you some sort of analytics assets all of that right so they also have like ai features obviously which is one of the very common use case for recording a meeting so this is an interesting product i'll leave the links for the blog post also below so they start with the blog post by saying ipc is something that is rarely top of the mind when it comes to optimizing cl cloud costs right so ipc is basically inter-process communication so right off the bat we sort of realize that this blog post is not about transferring data on websocket over internet it's something else entirely that's ipc that's inter-process communication so let's keep on reading and figure out what's going on here but it turns out that if you ipc one terabyte of video per second on aws it can result in enormous bill when done inefficiently okay so they are sort of like transferring one terabyte of video data per second somehow i don't know like maybe this is like the full number which they do not ideally like you know per instance or something i hope join us in this deep dive where we unexpectedly discover how using web sockets over loopback was ultimately costing us a million dollars in a year in aws spend and the quest for an efficient high bandwidth low latency ipc so they say that they power meeting bots for hundreds of companies we capture millions of meetings per minute per month and operate on enormous infrastructure so all of this is on aws right so what they're basically doing is that let's say i'll just give you a simple example of how a recall is working right let's say this is your google meet link right this is a meeting link where three people are already sitting. What Recall is saying that what these guys do is that they join the Google Meet link as a bot. So this is a bot and this is a Chromium instance, right? Chrome, Chromium, whatever. So this is a Chromium instance, but this bot, this speaker, this fourth member is a Recall bot. Now, once this has joined the meeting or once you have let it, let this bot in, what you can start doing is you can start recording this whole meeting session, right? Because if you look at their homepage, you can see like they are providing you with transcript.txt, video file.mp4, and all the stats and everything when whoever is joining what, right? So you need like a member in the meeting itself, which can observe everything. But just joining is not helpful, right? Because you need to get this data out of the browser itself. Right now, this whole thing is running inside a Chrome browser, right? So this, for example, would be meet.google.com slash abc, whatever the meeting link is. And everyone, including the all the users and the bot, are joined on this link. Now, in order for them to do their own processing, they need to get this stream of data outside. They want to get this data outside in some sort of container format or something. Otherwise, how would they even process it? So this sort of process processing let's say if they have some sort of rust process here right so let's say they are doing some sort of processing in rust and one of the processes in rust is launching this chromium instance and the second process is like actually transcoding or transcribing or whatever they would do with the data so this over here is the ipc which is inter-process communication where two processes two rust processes let's say are able to communicate with each other the one is launching chromium as an instance the second is the actual process which does some work on it so what they are effectively saying is that we used to transfer a terabyte per second i'm assuming that this is total volume this is not a one machine volume because this is too much you cannot have a terabyte of data from a single machine unless you are running a lot of lot of processes and a lot of containers so what i'm also assuming idly is that this whole thing is running inside a single container right so this most likely is container one and then you have certain such many many containers on a physical machine and they are probably renting out some bare metal compute from aws right with like 64 or 128 cores or something so they are able to run like i don't know like 32 to 64 sessions if even if they are giving like one to two vcpus to every google meet session so this is what sort of the architecture for them recall looks like on an overview and what they are saying is that this ipc one terabyte per second communication is extremely expensive for them now the reason i think that this is expensive is not because this communication per se is expensive the reason they say this is expensive is because this is consuming cpu right so let's say if you have a machine which is for the sake of argument let's say this is a 2v cpu machine 
and this one container itself is right now consuming 1.5 vcpu right let's say let's assume on average so what's happening is that you cannot run another process on top of this right you cannot run a second container because then it will degrade the performance so what you would want to do is create another machine and let's say if this is costing you 10 dollars a month let's say suddenly to record two sessions it's gonna cost you 20 dollars a month right but what they said is what if we reduce this 1.5 to 50 percent like we reduce the cost and it comes down to 0.75 now because this is a 2v cpu machine you can potentially record two sessions as well right if this is 0 0.8 or even 0 0.9 then you are able to record two sessions also for just ten dollars a month and that is where their most of the savings are coming from right which i i think i understand this that way so they say like we do our video processing on cpu instead of gpu before we started our optimization efforts our bots generally required four cpu cores to run smoothly in all circumstances so see like four cpu cores is an extreme amount of compute for something like this i think because you know if you look at modern cpus and raw compute power which they give four v cpus is like you know you are doing a lot of work over here these four CPU cores powered all parts of bots from headless chromium used to join meetings to the real time processing video pipelines to ingest the media. So, right. So, one of, you know, four VCPUs, Chrome can use multiple CPUs at a time. Then this Rust process, which is ingesting the video data continuously as it is getting streamed, it's ingesting that. And yeah, and this whole architecture is taking them four CPU cores. They set a goal for themselves to cut the CPU requirement in half. So, they wanted to go from four VCPU to run a single container, I'm assuming, to just two VCPUs. That will obviously give their cloud compute bill in half not because you know they would be able to somehow magically reduce the bill but they would be able to just double the amount of containers they are running per machine so obviously first of all they have to figure out why the cpu is getting used so much so they say that we profiled a sample of running bots and came to a shocking realization that the majority of our cpu time was actually being spent on two functions this mem move and then mem copy right so mem move and mem copy both are functions in c standard library that copies blocks of memory mem move handles a few edge cases around copying memory into overlapping regions but we can broadly categorize both these functions as copying memory. The suffix, this AVX unaligned ERMs, means that the function specifically is optimized for systems with advanced vector extensions, AVX, and is also optimized for unaligned memory access. The ERMs part stands for enhanced rep MOV SP STOSB, which are optimizations in the Intel processor for fast memory movement. Right, so these looks like some sort of assembly com commands. Um, so what they're basically saying is that most of their CPU time was getting eaten in these two functions right and in their profiling we discovered by far that the biggest scholars of these functions were in our python websocket client that was receiving the data followed by chromium's websocket implementation that was sending the data right so they had a python not a rust so goodbye rust so this is a python process which is a client which is receiving this data right i mean in this case it's slightly hard to sell which is client which is server because i don't know but they are saying that the python process is client and the chromium is the actual server so both the processes in fact even chromium is using these mem copy mem -woo commands and your python script is also using that for bots that join calls using headless chromium we needed a way to transport raw decoded video out of chromium's javascript environment and into our encoder we originally settled on running local websocket server connecting it to the javascript environment and sending data over that channel socket seems like a decent fit for our needs it was fast convenient to access within js supported binary data and most importantly was already built into chromium one complicating factor here is that the raw video is surprisingly high bandwidth a single 1080p frame in uncompressed i420 format is 1080 into 1920 which is like the number of pixels into the bit rate which is like the bytes per pixel into frames per second which is 93 megabytes per second that's a huge amount of data if you're just sending a raw frame directly over websocket you are effectively sending 93 mb per second which is something i mean i don't know like how many of you guys know but video encoding and decoding and image encoding and decoding these are some of the most fascinating computer science topics like how they built formats like containers and actual thing which is like jpeg or png or mp4 as a container video format how that works it's very very mathematical in terms of like how the compression and how the transcoding all of that happens and it's very fascinating because the raw data if you take a look at this this is true by the way like this resolution whatever resolution your screen has you have to send at least those many pixels then you have to in multiply it by the amount of memory a single pixel is occupying and then if you are you know streaming a video you effectively have to send 30 fps right in their case i think there are much there are many more tweaks they can do to just simply you know reduce their data a lot first thing i think they can 
just drop this from 30 to 24 or maybe 15 fps that would have also like immediately resulted in much less half the bandwidth but they if they want to keep like the full 1080p stream then of course they have to figure out the optimization somewhere else which is what this blog post is about right so you can't do anything about the data at, at least according to them so the next step was to figure out why specifically what was causing websocket transport to be so computationally expensive right so they started using websocket rfcs and chromium websocket implementation which is like open source code and they figured out that there are two problems the first one is fragmentation and second one is masking so websocket spec supports fragmenting messages this is the process of splitting a large message across several websocket frames right so the basic idea of fragmentation is that websocket what it says is that you can't just send go ahead and send 93 mb as a single message so you can't just yolo your you know you can't just send any sort of any amount of data over a websocket and call it a day the implementation which chromium has allows you to send a maximum of 131 kilobytes right and a raw frame without like the 30 fps multiplier at least is like three megabytes in size right so you have removed the 30 fps over here so you're not sending like the whole thing but even if you send like you know just one single frame you are splitting a one single frame into 24 messages 24 websocket frames themselves and now multiply it by 60 or 30 30 fps right because you need to send 30 frames per second so that effectively brings your count to 720 messages per second so you're doing an ipc of 720 720 messages per second which corresponds to close to like 100 MB per second, right? Or a single container, which is huge, huge amount of data. That's a lot of copying and duplicate work. The second problem is the masking data. Masking data involves obtaining a random 32-bit masking key and zoring the bytes of the original data with the mask key in 32-bit chunks. And the reason masking is done is to avoid confusing network intermediaries such as intercepting proxy and for security reasons that are further discussed in section 10.3, client must mask all the frames that it sends to the server. This is something I don't really understood why this is required because if you're doing it over HTTPS, I would assume that the data is already like sort of encrypted. Note that the masking is done whether or not the WebSocket protocol is running over TLS. Okay, so they have already mentioned in the spec that, hey, you have to do masking even if you are running it on SSL and the server must close the connection upon receiving a frame that is not masked. In this case, a server may send a closed frame with the status code of 1002 as defined in the section 7.4.1. A server, however, must not mask any frames that it sends to the client. A client must close connection if it detects a masked frame. Okay, this sounds a little bit weird to me, but may, there, I'm sure like there would be a reason so i mean when you're masking this data you are effectively masking 720 messages per second corresponding to like close to 100 megabytes of data every second you are masking right while this is great for security this downside is masking the data means that an additional once overpass over every byte sent over websocket insignificant for most web usage but a meaningful amount of work when you're dealing with 100 mb plus per second right so which is like which is what we also came to realize that this, they are doing like close to 100 mb a second and this is like a crazy cpu kill because you have to like mask every byte so we knew that we needed to move away from websocket so we began our quest to find a new mechanism we realized pretty quickly that browser apis are severely limited if you want to do something significantly more performant than websocket this means we need to fork chromium and implement something custom but this also meant that the sky was the limit so now they considered three options that is tcp ip unix domain sockets and shared memory right so websocket is not the answer because of course while you can just fork and patch websockets in certain way, certain way that they don't do masking or you know fragmentation but that would be slightly risky because now you're deviating away from the standard practices and something can crash and unless you're super sure on what you're doing you should probably not be doing that so it makes sense so chromium's websocket implementation and websocket spec in general create some especially bad performance pitfalls how about we go one level deeper and add an extension to chromium's chromium to allow us to send raw tcp ip packets over loopback device okay so instead of using websockets directly they just use like layer 4 protocol that is transmission control protocol tcp ip so once you do that it would prevent masking thing but like they say that the standard mtu which is maximum transmission unit is 1500 bytes it will still result in fragmentation right because you still would have to fragment like 3 me megabyte per frame packet this mtu is basically like how much data you can send in one packet even if the theoretical maximum size of a tcp ip packet is 64 kilobytes is much smaller than the 
the data we need to send. So you'll still suffer the fragmentation thing. There was another issue because the Linux networking stack runs in kernel space. Any packet we send over TCP IP needs to be copied from user space into kernel space, right? So, so of course, that is also an issue. If you're doing too much copying between user and kernel space, that would also lead to more CPU usage, hence minifying the benefits you are getting from doing something like this. Same with Unix domain sockets. You still have to copy from user space to kernel space. And back again with the volume of data we are working with, this is a decent amount of overhead. And Unix domains, as they say, are pretty fast. So the amount of bandwidth transfer would not be a concern, but they are still like, you know, because they are copying data from user space to kernel space a lot. What if they can still avoid that? The last thing which they covered is the shared memory. We realized we can go one step further, both TCP IP and Unix socket domains would at minimum require copying the data between user space and kernel space. With a bit of do it yourself, what we can do is we can introduce shared memory. Right, so shared memory is a memory that can be simultaneously accessed by multiple processes at a time. This means our Chromium could write a block of memory, which would then be read directly by our video encoder with no copying at all required between. Shared memory, like I discussed in that other video also, that can A equal 1 and A equal 2 and A equal 3 be true. Right? In that video, we discussed my solution to that question where we use shared memory with web workers. So shared memory is interesting, but it's also very risky because you can sort of like corrupt each other's processes, right? if you just start modifying things here and there. So shared memory is a memory. However, there is no standard interface for transporting data over shared memory. It's not like standard TCP IP or Unix domain. If we went the shared memory route, we would need to build the transport ourselves from ground up and there is a lot that could go wrong, right? So the lower in stack you go, the more responsibility you have, the more benefits you also get, but things can blow in your face also. Obviously, like if you are about to save a million dollars in a year, this makes some level of motivation, right? Shared memory for maximum efficiency was the way to go. As we continuously need to read and write the data serially into our shared memory, we settled on a ring buffer as our high level transport. So there are a quite a few implementations of ring buffer in Rust community, but we had specific requirements. So it has to be lock free, multiple producers, single consumer, because they are they have like Chromium is writing audio and video data continuously, you know, whoever is speaking, whoever is sharing screen, whatever it is on the screen into the buffer and a single thread media pipeline consuming this data so there's process which is transcoding at least the one which consumes the data is just a single process dynamic frame sizes zero copy reads so we don't they don't want to do copy because copying is expensive when you are working with such a high amount of data sandbox friendliness due to chromium sandboxing and low latency signaling so they wrote their own implementation of a ring buffer the most non-standard part of our ring buffer implementation is our support for zero copy reads instead of the typical two pointers we have three pointers in our ring buffer the write pointer, the peak pointer, and the read pointer. So I am at a loss of words here, like what exactly they are doing, because I have never really worked with ring buffers and this sort of implementation myself directly. But looking at this diagram, what I'm able to see is that they somehow hooked Chromium to a Rust process where Chromium is supposed to write or Chromium's memory is supposed to consider this ring buffer as the primary source of memory, right? And Chromium uses this read pointer to write more data. So your ring buffer, let's say, has some, some sort of size of five, 600 megabytes, or I don't know, like one gigabyte. And Chromium keeps on writing on this buffer, right? From the read pointer, from the write pointer, sorry, not from the read pointer. The peak pointer is the pointer which the single thread is taking a look at. So it's keeping on reading it. And the read pointer is the address where data can be overwritten. Interesting. So to support zero copy reads, we feed frames from peak pointer into our media pipeline and only advance the read pointer when the frame has been fully processed. So what they are saying is that peak pointer and read pointer are technically sort of same, but we only push read pointer ahead once peak pointers like we have already like covered whatever we need to do, whatever we need to do with the peak pointers video frame, video processing. We use atomic operations to update the pointers in a thread safe manner because the write pointer obviously is getting updated by Chromium. The read pointer and peak pointer is getting updated by this Rust process or whatever process this is. And they have to use atomic operations to update pointers in a thread safe manner because both of them are in different threads, different processes. And to signal the new data is available, we use named semaphore. After implementing this ring buffer and deploying it into the production with a few other optimizations, we were able to reduce CPU usage of our bots up to 50% which saved over a million dollars per year. That means they are probably doing like 2 million a year in infrastructure on AWS, just on this part, which is huge. $2 million a year on cloud compute is huge. I mean, I don't know like how much they can save by just going off the cloud, right? 
and if they have a sustained usage pattern already like they can probably drop it by 10x further so this is a nice engineering block but i think like if you're all if you're trying to do is like reduce the cost a bit more you can also like shift off the cloud i mean of course it has its own challenges but maybe that is also worth it but yeah that's pretty much it for this video make sure you like and subscribe to the channel let me know in the comments what do you think about this i will see you in the next video really soon